All right. Welcome everyone. My name is Sarah McAnulty. Um, I'm from Skype a Scientist and today we are super excited that you're all here. Happy New Year. This is our first Skype a Scientist live session of the year. We are here with Dr. Deborah Thompson uh, who's going to be talking to us about the concept of one health. So the, the how the health of the environment and plants and animals and humans are all connected and how, uh, you know, caring for our environment is caring for us too. Um, so we're super excited to hear um, from you, Deborah. Thank you for being with us today. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation. I think this is a fantastic way to kick off the new year of 2022. Actually, I wanted to just tell everybody Happy One Health Awareness Month. Did you know that this is One Health Awareness Month, the month of January? So whatever you learn here today, feel free to tell others because this is such an important topic. Let's get started. What is One Health? One Health, the concept is it's the connection between animal health, human health, environmental health. And what do I mean by the environment? I mean plants, I mean water, I mean air. So it makes sense. Clean water means healthy people. A sick environment see, means sick people or sick animals. We're all connected. We don't live in bubbles, we're all connected. So let's walk through an example of where One Health really plays into um, everyday life for everyday people. There's also one other thing I want to mention. In the back of your minds, think of this. So I reviewed the One Health concept. And again, it's that connection between our health and the health of the environment, animals, and plants. But the One Health approach is teamwork. It's teamwork between people of different backgrounds, disciplines, strengths. We come together and we prevent and solve health problems. Makes sense, right? Well, here's the example with One Health. Now let's imagine we are in a beautiful forest. The sun is shining. The water is clean nearby. The air is fresh. The animals are healthy in the forest. They are happy. They don't have to compete for food or for shelter. There's enough space and shelter for everybody. And then something changes. So what changes? The forest is now shrinking, right? The forest is shrinking. It could be because of several reasons. It could be because people are cutting down trees to make more farmlands or to clear for, uh, clear forests to make houses or because they need to take the trees for paper or they have polluted the environment in such a way that the trees are not alive anymore. For one reason or another, the forest is shrinking. What happens to the animals when they live in a smaller place? Think of it like this, it's the same number of animals, but they have to compete more for food, for shelter. So what happens? Is that a comfortable environment? Or do you think that they'd be experiencing stress? It'd be really stressful. It'd be really stressful. And just like you and me, Whenever we have prolonged periods, long periods of stress, we can have our cortisol, our hormone go up, and that can also weaken our immune system. Same thing happens for animals. And I know this because I am a veterinarian. I am an animal doctor. So if animals are having a weakened immune system and they have germs that typically don't cause any problems for themselves, but their immune system is so much weaker, then they're going to start to show signs of illness. And if they cough, if they sneeze, if they spread these germs in any other way, well, then that could be a problem. Now, let's take this one step further. The forest is shrinking even more. That means that the animals have to either leave the forest and try to find another forest or 
they have to go out near where the people are. Now, is that ideal for animals? Do you think they would prefer to be near people or they would prefer to be in this forest? Probably the forest, right? But they don't have a choice, right? Because of competition. So they go out of the forest and they look for food and for shelter. But there's a problem there because remember what I said with stressed animals and even stressed people, we can show more signs of sickness. And there's something called a zoonotic disease. A zoonotic disease is a, is a sickness, is a disease, is a germ that can jump between different species. Now, if there's more contact between animals including people that don't belong near each other, that it, then that increases the chance of germs spreading between different species. And that's not good. Okay, let's take this one step further with this one health example. Now let's say the competition has gotten so big that a bird leaves, okay? Either, either that particular species either dies off or it leaves the forest completely. Let's take this even one further step and say all of the birds leave. The hawks, the eagles, the little chickadees, the little pigeons, all of them disappear because they don't have the food or the shelter or there's a hurricane that blew them all out for one reason or another. In this hypothetical situation, all the birds leave. What will be the differences after these birds leave. Let's explore together. So number one, there are going to be less trees. Why would there be less trees? Let's think about what birds do. Birds can be seed dispersers. They could act as pollinators. So if there are less pollinators and seed dispersers in the environment, there are gonna be less trees. Number two, there are more mice. Why would there be more mice? If all the birds leave, every single type of bird, why would there be more mice? because they will not be eaten by the hawks and by the eagles and by the birds of prey. Okay, so there are less trees and there are more mice. Why would there be more foxes? Why would there be more foxes? It's because there are more mice to eat. Do you see, just by changing one thing in the environment, everything else can be affected. And so now look at where all these animals are. Where are all of these animals? Are they in the forest? No, they're forced out and they're living near people. But why are they living near people? Because of how people have treated the environment to such an extent that it is not uh, supportive of the life it once had. So remember what I mentioned about zoonotic diseases? Zoonotic diseases are germs or diseases that can jump between different species. This is a terrible situation if you think about it. Not only is it stressful for animals and for people, but this is a very easy situation for a germ to jump between different species. And for statistics, up to three quarters or up to 75% of diseases that jump between different organisms are considered to be zoonotic. So just to give you an idea of how serious this is. Now, let's just review. There are no more birds. Why? Because um, either there was too much competition for food or shelter, or because the the environment just was not uh, conducive to having them stay there. There are less trees, why? Because birds disperse seeds and they help with pollination as well. Why are there more mice? 
because the eagles and the hawks are gone? Why are there more foxes? Because there are more mice. And why are there more wild animals in human areas? It's because the humans have moved into the areas where wild animals once lived. So we talked about zoonotic diseases. And this, um, I'll just briefly say that I started a, an organization called One Health Lessons. And we at One Health Lessons teach this type of material. And we have these lessons be really interactive and, and fun and educational for the children. And we teach around the world. And at this point, it's, it's free of charge. So if you're interested uh, for the teachers, please let us know and we can, we can teach a lot of different lessons about One Health. But this is something that uh, is taken from that lesson, from one of the lessons, and it's called the mystery box. And it's an activity that goes along with it. But this mystery box activity just shows that one virus can combine with another virus in something else. And they can, com they can combine to make a whole new virus. Red plus blue equals purple. And that can happen in a lot of different organisms and a lot of different species, particularly in pigs. So if you've heard of swine flu or pig flu or avian influenza, which is a big deal right now, bird flu, it's a big, big, big deal. What happens is that a bird flu virus enters into a pig, a human flu virus enters into a pig, a pig flu virus enters into a pig, and they all mix and match, and they come out as a single virus. That can then invade humans, pigs, and as you can imagine, multiple species. So why is this important? This is really important to not only understand for, of course, scientists, but it's really important to understand if you are living on this planet, right? Because ultimately, how we treat the environment plays a role in our own health. And sick animals can cause sick people. Sick people can cause sick animals. We're all related. And One Health, if you think about it, having that mindset and thinking about the One Health approach where people from different backgrounds and disciplines and strengths, we come together to prevent and solve health problems, that can save the world. So happy to answer questions. Um, One Health is my absolute passion as well as education. So this is really a treat for me. And let's get started with questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. So everybody, if you have questions, please submit them to the Q&A and I'll be asking them out loud uh, now. Um, okay, so just to, to kick it off, I just want to ask Deborah, like how did you originally get interested in this topic? Yeah, so it's interesting because I, I said originally before a bunch of people signed on that I have a bachelor's of music, but I also have a bachelor's of science. And when I was doing my bachelor's of science, I was up in Canada at McGill University. I was taking a lot of ecology classes, so studying um, ecosystems, and I never heard the term One Health. But when I went to veterinary school, that's when I heard the term One Health. And I was like, whoa, two things happened, honestly, two things. Number one, my life made sense. And number two, why didn't I know about this 20 years before? Why didn't I know about this five years before in my undergraduate degree? If I knew this when I was six years old, would I have changed the way I treated the environment? Would I have, say, picked up litter? Um, on a hike? Uh, would I have um, used less paper, for instance? You know, things like that. Um, would I have shut off the lights more? Would I have uh, stopped running the water so often, right? So those types of things uh, really hit home. Plus, before going to veterinary school, I was teaching. I was teaching in primary schools and secondary schools, and I was teaching adults, lots of different um, subjects. And now that I know about One Health and I see the importance of it, I combine One Health with my passion of education and that's how One Health Lessons was born. Awesome, thanks. All right, we got a question from Tommy. Um, this is a hard question. What is the, the worst thing an animal could get? 
Ooh. The worst thing when you're talking about viruses and diseases and th things like that, I would say the same thing for people, probably the worst thing an animal, well, you know, humans are animals too. So the worst thing an organism can get is a type of germ that can, um, that can kill it and have it have no cure. So modern medicine is pretty special. Modern medicine is pretty uh, phenomenal. If you think about what we have at our disposal today versus a hundred years ago or 200 years ago, it's vastly different yeah. because of technology and engineering and, and biomedical sciences. Well, thanks. We got a question, the similar question from Garden Spot and Aparna. Um, is COVID-19 a zoonotic disease? Yeah, it is. Um, we've seen animals catch um, COVID from people and we've seen people catch COVID from animals. So we do know it is a zoonotic disease. For sure. Um, the next question is from Henry. What would happen if we planted the trees back that maybe we or others took away um, with the birds or whatever other environmental impacts that removing the trees have, would that come back? Awesome question. Um, so we have to think about exactly what trees are what's called endemic or naturally supposed to be in that particular environment. So when you replant trees, be sure to do it uh, in a way that these are native trees to that area. It reminds me of a movie called Little Big Farm that I do recommend people watch, Little Big Farm. It's a really good movie that shows this, this, um, this, barren farmland that once they start building, uh, putting in trees, then everything came back to life within just a matter of years. But keep in mind, people, the population, the human population is growing, growing, growing on this planet, right? So rather than building out, we need to think about building up, if that makes any sense, um, so that we can respect the environment that much more. But yes, uh, replanting trees, excellent idea. Try to find the native species in your area to plant. Yeah, it's just, it's complicated because sometimes when you put something back, things kind of readjust and other times it's like, it's kind of too late for that environment. So it's, it's so context specific that it's hard to answer that question for like all places everywhere, but putting them back is better than not putting them back for sure. The next question is from Colby. Do you think any animals will disappear soon? And if so, which animals? Yeah, um, unfortunately, yes. Yeah, it is true. Um, there, uh, which ones? Uh, there are many that are on the metaphorical chopping block right now, unfortunately, because of how the environment has been treated over the last you know, decades, if not hundreds of years. Um, it, there are people who are trying their best to conserve these animals, um, but there are websites um, that list the highly endangered, the critically endangered species. So I do recommend you, you look at that and also explore why are they endangered? Because it's not like, poof, they're gone. No, 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 there's a reason for it. And then ask yourself, what can you do to further this message of One Health so that you can even try to save, save species in general? So great question. Thanks. The next question is from Emmeline. Could animals eventually work together to fight back against humans destroying the forest? We haven't seen it yet. Definitely, I don't think so because they don't have the technology. Yeah. I mean, I should say like, it's not, it's not all humans, like all populations of humans are not equally destructive too. So when we, we, we often uh, sometimes hear like humans are bad, humans are destroying, but we don't have to be like, that's, a, that's not, that's not a default setting in humans. And a lot of populations of humans are really live in harmony with animals and plants and don't cause this huge destruction. And so um we shouldn't uh, perpetuate this like false narrative that uh, that like our existence is bad. That's not true. Like we are animals just like anybody else. And and so, you know, just want to put that out there. Um, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, 
All righty. Uh, here's a good question from Tommy. What's your favorite animal? <laughs> I don't play favors because I am a veterinarian. So I'll treat any, any species of animal minus humans. Great. Uh, Colin's got a question. Has any animal ever completely gone extinct from a disease? Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I can't think of one right now, but yeah, absolutely. Cool. There's definitely populations that have been totally wiped out. Um, one example that you can think of, um, I don't think every individual got completely wiped out, but it was, I think some populations of um, the giant, those, those big uh, sea, starfish, sea stars in the Pacific Northwest, there was a wasting disease that because the climate was, this is a perfect example actually of, of One Health, that it was, the ocean was getting warmer and in the warming conditions, a certain pathogen, so that's like a, a germ basically, um, was able to take over the bodies of the sea stars more than it would in colder water. And so these big, big, big sea stars, um, the ones with like many, 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 many arms, um, just got totally wiped out in the warmer waters. And so they're they're moving north to stay in colder water and the northern or populations are okay. But in the more southern populations, I don't know if there are like scientists are like, we're not really sure if they're going to come back or, or what. So there's at least an example of a population going kaput because of a disease brought on by climate change, um, or at least enabled by climate change. Um, the next question is from Mia. Do you have any advice? This is a great question, Mia. Um, do you have any advice for action kids can take to help animals in their local environment? Oh my gosh, I love this question. Um, absolutely. So um, besides, of course, inviting your teacher to, to get more, uh, more lessons in the classrooms, um, I would say uh, speak with your local uh, zoo or your local animal sanctuary and see what you can do uh, for volunteer work with them. Um, sometimes there are certain contests or competitions uh, that uh, are are brought about by these uh, organizations. Sometimes there are fundraising events, things like that. Um, and get on social media if your parents allow it, of course, um, and speak about what you learned today and speak about One Health and that, you know, everything is connected. Um, I think that's a really important message to make sure everybody is aware of in uh, 2022. Awesome. Thanks. Our next question is from Yosef. Will climate change affect, uh, eventually affect house animals in some way? Ah, um, probably. I think climate change will be affecting everything on this planet um, and because the climate change affects food sources too, right? And um, just like food and water will ultimately uh, be a driving factor for more people, it's going to be the same thing for house animals and uh, other animals out outdoors as well. Thank you. Um, the next question is, can deforestation affect our oceans? Ah, yes, yes. Uh, because of um, erosion and because of water runoff from the land and there are certain um, nutrients in the soil that should be staying in the soil, but if they go into the water source and out into the ocean, it changes, um, and maybe Sarah, you could speak more to it, but it, it changes the acidity and the pH and uh, the nitrogen and all that yeah. and affects uh, the, the plant life and the animal life. Is that correct? That's exactly right. So the word for that is eutrophication is um, uh, what, what happens. So it's, it's, it's complicated, but, but one of the things that happens um, is that when there are fewer trees, particularly around the oceans, these trees called mangroves, they um, are like half in the water, half on land. They have these big leggy uh, root systems that you can see with your eyes. Um, when you get rid of those, and that often happens when people are building like homes on the water or resorts on the water down in tropical areas um, where everybody wants to hang out because it's gorgeous. Um, when you remove those, 
uh, instead of having all the, the sediment and the dirt and, and all of that sort of get trapped within the roots and then create this lovely little um, nutrient rich environment right smack there, it just goes into the water. And then the water near the coast gets super nutrient rich, which sounds like a good thing, but the algae get just totally take off. They completely have what's called an algae bloom. And when the algae bloom, it sucks up all of the, like the oxygen uh, in the surrounding water and uh, kills uh, other things, which is not great. Um, and then also sometimes it prevents light from getting further down into the water, which affects animals that rely on light. So uh, yeah, another classic, everything is connected story uh, from the ocean. Um, alrighty, uh, Henry wants to know what would happen if all of the trees disappeared other than eutrophication? Of course. Yeah, besides erosion and, and all of that. Um, well, certainly there'd be less photosynthesis, but keep in mind, there are other plants, uh, there are other plants on this planet, right? Um, let's hope that there will always be trees on this planet because I would be uh, very frightened to see what happens to the atmosphere uh, and the wellness of this planet if trees had disappeared. Yeah, the other issue um, with the trees being removed far from the coast, um, and we actually just had a session uh, on this for adults back in December, all about soil, is that the soil in a place is really, really important for, for us, for agriculture. And so when you don't have plants with a lot of root systems, and in some places, that important plant is like prairie plants, like, like these big tall grasses whose root systems go like 12 feet deep. They really keep everything right where it is, uh, just like the mangroves did. And um, when it rains, and of course with climate change, we're getting a lot more heavy rainstorms in places that we didn't used to in recent history. And so a lot of the dirt that we need for growing soybeans and corn and, and all the stuff that we eat all the time goes into the river and then out to the ocean and we just kind of lose access to that soil. So that's another losing your trees problem. Uh, trees and also yeah. prairie plants. Yeah, I was going to say soil health is so important for sure. For the of the planet. If you're interested, I, I think any student here could watch that session. It's up on our YouTube channel. It really goes into depth about why soil is important, what is uh, happening with soil degradation right now, and also what people can do and so like specific bills that, that we can focus on to fix that problem. Because there are like little changes that we can, we can make um, agriculturally to really prevent a lot of that runoff from happening that really wouldn't um, be too hard to implement. So check, check that out. For sure. There's also um, a, a video uh, for teachers uh, for classrooms called Kiss the Ground that is really, really, really good. So something to think about. Awesome. Yeah, that would be really cool. Um, all righty. So um, Cheyenne wants to know, will we ever run out of fresh water because of de diseases and deforestation? I'm sorry, could you say that one more time? Uh, yeah, I can. Uh, will we ever run out of fresh water because of de uh, diseases and deforestation? It is possible. I hope that governments nip this in the bud real fast now. And that's the important thing with technologists and engineers. Like we all have to work together to stop something like that from happening. Uh, we have to figure out how can we uh, recycle water in a way that keeps people and animals and the environment healthy. So um, the nice thing is that there are scientists and technologists, all STEM, STEAM advocates around the world working towards this. Um, but what, what needs to happen more is more conversations between people of different backgrounds in order to make this as efficient as possible. Absolutely. Thanks. The next question is from Joseph. Is Earth going to become like Venus or Mars? Not sure. Maybe Hopefully million, not soon. You know, yeah. 10 million years? I don't know. I, I'm not a space person and I uh and I don't so 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 take this with a grain of salt. Um, but eventually the sun's gonna get a little bit bigger. This is eventually like like 
so far away that it's not a thing that you or I need to worry about at all. This one's going to get a little bit bigger. And so the reason that Mercury and Venus are the way that they are is because it's like way hotter there. It's closer to the sun. And so the sun's going to grow a little bit and get closer to us. So we're going to end up being burnt up, but like, don't worry, we've got bigger fish to fry, like right in the next decade and hundred years. This is like, I don't know if it's a billion years or hundreds of million years away, but definitely not not something we have to worry about, worry about, um, but will eventually happen, unfortunately. Okay, Mila would like to uh, uh, know, if there's oxygen in the water, how come we can't breathe underwater? That is such a good question. Um, yeah, so we lack um, the filtration process like fish do in our bodies. We are built in a different way. We have been designed for land only. Um, as in not breathing underwater. Um, yeah, the if you're interested, just look online and, and uh, look at the, uh, just look up the gill, like gill, G-I-L-L -L system in fish. And it is absolutely fascinating how they work. Um, but yeah, we unfortunately don't have that type of system in our own bodies. And that's why we can't breathe underwater. A shame, but true. Um, a question comes in from Kestrel. Are there any foods uh, that can pass diseases? So like foods that you can get diseases from? Yeah, yeah. And that's why um, the USDA, uh, the United States Department of Agriculture, and then the equivalent in all other countries, um, look for what's called foodborne diseases. Things like salmonella. Um, salmonella is a bacteria that's uh, shared from either raw raw meats or raw vegetables. And whenever there's a salmonella outbreak, it, it's by contaminated soil um, or contaminated um, uh, fecal material from the slaughterhouse. But it's uh, it can definitely cause problems in people. So because of that, that's why it's really important to avoid raw meat and to wash your vegetables real well before eating them. For sure. Um, we've got two questions that are pretty similar from Mabel and Colin. What would happen if there were only humans on the planet? And Colin's related question is, what would happen if all animals went extinct? Yeah, if humans were the only things on this planet, humans wouldn't survive. We would die, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, like, I mean, think about it, just, just to go through, like we breathe in oxygen, right? But then what's providing the oxygen? And then what would we eat? And what would we drink, right? right. So think of it like that. Totally, totally. Uh, the next question is, how many trees do we need to plant for a positive impact? I don't know the answer to that. I think any tree is a good tree, like, like adding a tree, like what, it depends on the readout of, of good. Uh, so that's a very complex question, but generally speaking, any additional tree is a good tree. Um, and even like adding trees also depends on where you put it. So like, let, I live in Philadelphia, I live in a concrete jungle. It is just concrete as far as the eye can see in this city. And when I put a tree in front of my house, like even my electricity bill in the summer goes down because the shade from that tree uh, makes my house a little bit cooler. And so that is an impact right there. That's an impact for sure. Any less energy I'm using on air conditioning is, is better. So that's one, one tree in the right place. And so you gotta uh, think about what your readout is for impact, but all trees are- nice. Yeah. And just bouncing off of that a little bit, I think we on this planet need to think about the world in a, we have to think out of the box a little bit because technology and engineering has, a, has become so advanced that why can't we build cars that act like trees that suck in CO2 and expel oxygen? Just like photosynthesis. If these redwoods in California can grow up to the highest parts and they have that energy, is there a way to use that similar type of energy to fuel an automobile, for instance? Like, do we have to have real trees out there or can we have these like uh, pseudo trees that we use in everyday life? Do you see what I mean? Now it doesn't exist yet, but can you design something like that? There is some 
car, and we talked about this in the clean energy and batteries um, episode from last semester, that like their output instead of carbon dioxide is water. So they're like constantly drip dripping, um, which is wild. And I don't know the details. I just know that there people are working on this stuff, but it's not quite at the level that we can use it um, like in a local Toyota or whatever. Um, so I have faith that if, uh, if Gen, whatever Gen I am, a millennial doesn't figure it out, then a Gen Z is going to figure it out or whatever comes out after a Gen Z is going to figure it out. It will happen. Um, let's see the next question. Um, Hmm, from Sasha, what would happen if more animals on earth became tame? Would that have any impact on the planet? If they became tame, then that means that they are closer to human beings, which is not necessarily the best thing for them or for us because we can share diseases. They could share diseases. Like it goes both ways. So I would say the best thing to think about is to respect the natural distance between different species and um, allow uh, wild animals to be wild. Good advice. Um, this is from Garden Spot. What would the earth look like if humans suddenly disappeared? Huh. There's a book on um, it called um, The World Without Us that goes into super depth about this question if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, but I don't, uh, I read it, but I don't remember the answer. Yeah, I think just speculative um, that the world will rebalance itself. Nature would rebalance itself um, over a course of time uh, to make it look like uh, what life was like before humans. That's my thought. For sure, yeah. The next question is, uh, will we ever run out of unsustainable resources? Yep, yep, yep. Uh, it's only a matter of time. Um, is it possible, this is the next question from Emerson. Is it possible for scientists to recreate extinct animals? Huh. Um, they're actually, I mean, be because, uh, biological sciences has been so advanced there has been um you know cloning has existed since what 1997 1996 something like that um with dolly the sheep um and there is cryogenic uh, cryogenics right with uh, freezing um i i'm i can't name a particular species that has been attempted to be brought back, but then there are ethical concerns too. Because if you bring something back that went extinct naturally, why did it go extinct? Was it because the environment was not, did not allow it to survive? And then if that's the case, why would we want to bring it back if it's not gonna survive? Right. You see what I mean? It opens up a lot of questions there. For sure. Um, this is a question from HR. Uh, I hope not human resources. Maybe it is human resources. Could DNA help stop diseases like COVID-19, influenza, et cetera? Oh my gosh, such a good question. Okay, so this actually goes to um, this. So with One Health Lessons, and you can find it on onehealthlessons.com, we have, we just launched a second lesson that was about the science behind the COVID-19 vaccine. And it focuses on the woman behind the science of this vaccine, which is super cool, super inspirational. But we talk about mRNA, messenger RNA. Messenger RNA, think of it like this. In the like most simplistic terms, it's the instructions to make a protein. What do proteins do? Proteins help cells function. They provide structure. They help send signals. They, they make the world go round, <laughs> OK? Um, and mRNA eventually comes from the origin, or the originator is DNA, DNA transcription. Ugh. Anyway, messenger RNA is really uh, something that's changing the, the world today. Like if you, if you just type in messenger RNA or mRNA research and type in cancer or type in um, COVID or type in any other type of disease, you could probably find some really, really, really interesting uh, material there. And definitely this is a whole new uh, game for biological sciences right now. Really for exciting. Sure. It's really, really cool. 
Um, awesome. The next question is from Rydar. How do diseases slash viruses mutate inside pigs and other animals? Hmm. Yeah. So what happens is that a virus uh, enters into a pig or, or, or another animal um, or person, right? Uh, it gets to a certain area of your body inside of cells, and then it meets just by happenstance another virus. What happens is that the DNA uh, or RNA, uh, whatever the genetic code is, sometimes they combine and that's called genetic reassortment. Um, and when you have like one, uh, one uh, blip, let's say, I don't want to use all the technical words in case I miss people, but one section of DNA from virus A and then one section from virus B and then one section of virus A, one section of virus B, it kind of combines those two viruses and it makes a whole new virus that can then uh, invade other species, uh, which makes it that much more uh, malleable, <laughs> that much more uh, flexible and that much more concerning. So it is possible. Uh, you could look up swine flu, or of course, again, you could ask uh, One Health Lessons to come and teach a class, so. Great. Um, next question's from Charlie. When did climate change approximately start? Oof. Do you know the answer to that, Sarah? So, okay, so so let's let's like zoom way out before humans and everything. Climate always changes like in cycles a little bit over time, but never like super duper fast. So typically when we're talking about climate change, we're talking about the last 200 ish years. And it really got going like big time um, around the beginning of the industrial revolution when we started burning a bunch of uh, coal and other fossil fuels, putting carbon dioxide in the air and then heating it all up. So um, broad brushstrokes, when did, when did modern rapid climate change start at the industrial revolution is the answer to that one. Um, okay, the next question. Okay, do you feel like humans were supposed to evolve the way we did? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, you know, I would say when it comes to evolution, and adapt, you know, selection and adaptive pressures and things like that, natural selection. Um, I guess the answer is automatically yes, because with any organism, uh, if it were to survive as a species, right, it has to adapt appropriately to the to the pressures of that particular environment that it lives in. Um, so has it been successful? Yes, because we're still alive. We're still here on this planet. Um, I think that, uh, you know, going forward, the more pressure we put on this planet, they're going to be that much more stress put on not only our species, but all the other species. And the, if we continue at this trajectory, it's going to be the, the strongest wins and the strongest will survive. And that's nature. That's nature. There's no, no supposed to. It just is what happens, happens. Um, let's see. Uh, Colin, do you think polar bears, polar bears will go extinct? Yeah. Me too. Um, although here's, here's one interesting thing. Um, polar bears are starting to mate with brown bears and create, I forget what the name of the mix bear is, but sometimes, and this is also what happened with the Neanderthals. So um, back in, I wanna say it was Germany where Neanderthals lived, um, they mated with human, like modern humans. And so a lot of European populations have Neanderthal DNA mixed in because we were, close enough that the mating worked and created healthy offspring. And so are there Neanderthals today? No, but there's Neanderthal DNA in many European populations. And, and so their DNA got passed on, even if uh, they are not here. And so that's totally happening with polar bears right now. Um, will those mixed bears go on and survive or will they not? We don't know yet. Uh, it's sort of up in the air. And a lot of times animals are really surprising us um, when uh, we kind of uh, throw things at them with climate change. Um, what we might predict would happen is not always 
uh, what would happen. And I read a book about this called Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid. Um, it's by Thor Hansen uh, and it, it's really interesting. And it goes into a lot of like uh, case studies of different animals and how they're reacting to climate change in various ways. Like for example, um, there was a study done on anoles, which are these little lizards um, and they, certain islands in the Caribbean were getting hit by really hardcore hurricanes, um, but differently. Like some had been hit multiple times, some islands had been hit once, and the different populations of lizards you could already see were adapting differently because some of them, the ones that got hit repeatedly by hurricanes, some of their toes were getting much longer and grippier so that they could like hold on for dear life to a tree. Um, and so, you know, will a polar bear change its diet, change its lifestyle, um, evolve quickly like these anoles in the Caribbean to handle it. It's possible. Um, it's just really, really hard to say. So that's my long-winded answer for a short question. Um, good point. You never know with animals. They're, uh, if you threaten something with death, you never know what it's going to do. Um, let's see. Okay. Here's an interesting question. Is it better or worse for a human to build a new home inland or on the coast for the sake of the environment uh, whoa That's um good. well you know if it's on the coast then i would fear in 10 years if the house will still be there yeah so that's yeah. that's the first thing that comes to mind uh just because of water levels and erosion and, and all that um is it better or worse for the environment? I think it depends on the particular situation. Like, was the land already cleared? Yeah. Things like that. Yeah. Um, okay, Tommy wants to know, have you personally, uh, I suspect the answer is yes, ever saved an animal before? Yes. Yeah, uh, very cool. Uh, so, so how many, are you still currently a vet or are you? Uh, okay, very cool. So. Um, and do you, do you work mostly with animals that live in houses or all other animals? Uh, my smallest patient was this big, little dwarf hamster, super cute, super cute. Uh, and then my largest patient was an Asian elephant. Whoa, that's big. That's quite a size range. Um, Miss McLean wants to know, uh, if you had to treat a fish, how would you do it? Ooh, actually fish can be trained. Um, uh, <laughs> I would do it with food as, as a, a training source. Um, but yeah, you can have them, um, equate, you know, food with, uh, they can also see color too, believe it or not. Uh, so you can, uh, I don't, I don't know about their sound. I mean, sure there, there must be sound, but I don't know outside of the tank what, I don't know, Sarah, you probably know more of this, but yes, you can train fish is the short answer. And how do you do it? I would use um, food as a, as a way to help with that process. For sure. Um, and also just yesterday, there was a, a paper that was making the rounds on social media that um, was showing that they trained a fish to like get around its environment using a little robot. And I am gonna put that in the chat for you all right now. It looks like a little like rolly, uh, car robot with a little tank on top with a fish in it and how the fish moves determines where the robot goes so like can you train a fish without a doubt yes um and that's gonna have to be our last question because we're out of time i lost track of time and we're already five minutes over because there were so many questions from you all thank you all so much for coming um we always ask the same two questions at the end of every session um and those two are first Deborah, if you had everyone's attention in the whole world and you could tell them one thing related to your area of expertise, what would it be? We need to have one health and one health approach in every single thing that we do. Awesome. And your second question is, you still have everybody's attention in the world. You can tell them one thing about absolutely anything. It can be big picture, serious, important, or silly and insignificant. What do you tell them? Believe in yourself and never give up. Great. Sounds good. Uh, well, everybody, we are going to be meeting back here on uh, the 12th of January. We're going to be talking about something. Um, it's going to be great. I have faith. Uh, what are we talking about next week? We are talking about, oh, this is going to be so cool. We're talking about carbon recapture, otherwise known as turning carbon dioxide into rocks. Uh, so yeah, it's super cool. Taking the carbon dioxide from the air, putting it back into a rock so that maybe 
we can mitigate some of those effects of all the fossil fuel burning we've been doing over the last 200 years. Um, you can get all the information for that on skypeascientist.com. We hope to see lot, lots of you there. Um, Kay, thank you for uh, interpreting for us as always. Um, Deborah, thanks for spending the time with us. This was super cool. Um, is there anything else to share before we say goodbye? Just want to say happy One Health Awareness Month, and hopefully you can all share what you learned today with your uh, friends and family. Absolutely. Like Catherine Hayhoe says, the most important thing you can do for climate change is talk to other people about climate change than your social circles. So get going and do it. Um, we'll see you next week. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everyone.